Welcome back to Pyrarchy. This is KC coming to you with the new series that I'm getting started on this channel. So this series is going to be ranking all number one overall picks in NBA history by their careers. So this is going to be a pretty straightforward series. Uh, I'm going to be looking at all the players that went number one overall in the NBA draft all the way back to the beginning of the NBA and ranking them by how well they lived up to the hype of being the number one overall pick throughout their NBA career. Um, so I'm not going to do a deep dive on each player's play style in this one like I have in past tier lists. I'm mainly going to be just covering their career stats, some notable things about them, and ranking them. Because there are some players that there really isn't that much to deep dive on. And also, a lot of it would be kind of kind of repetitive, um, especially with some of these earlier players. Um, but the tiers will be as follows. So S tier is like an elite player, probably a Hall of Famer, definitely exceeded expectations with the draft pick. Um, a is going to be a multiple time All Star and met the hype of being a number one overall pick. May not be may not be a multiple time All Star in some cases. More than likely, they will be multiple time All Stars in the A tier. Uh, B would be an acceptable player, but a minor letdown based on where they were taken. Um, C, solid-ish player, but a disappointment for a number one. And F, bad, didn't play, huge disappointment, basically. Um, but yeah, so F tier is just going to be guys that were either just really, really terrible or didn't play at all, which there are some. So, here is, this This tier list is going to be kind of on the early days of basketball. So a lot of these names you probably won't even know. I didn't know most of these guys, and I've been into basketball for a long time. Um, but, you know, there's probably going to be a lot of guys here that go F tier. Um, the really, really early NBA was a weird time. But I do think some of these players have pretty pretty interesting and sometimes pretty funny um, backstories and pretty interesting names, too, sometimes, uh, which I think is worth, worth mentioning. And I think it's sometimes pretty interesting to learn about some of these early players um, and some of the stories around them and just how the NBA became what it is today versus what it was then because it was a much different environment. But I think it's I think it's cool to learn about the history um, of the league. So with all that being said, let's get right into it with Clifton McNeely, the 5'10 forward. Cool distinction of being the first guy ever picked. So basically he played at Texas Wesleyan for a couple years in 1940 to 1942 left the team to go fight in World War II, rejoined Texas Wesleyan in 1946-47, and in his last season led the NAIA in scoring, which was the division he played in. Um, I can't particularly find any stats on the guy when it comes to college, but I assume based on context, the dude could score pretty well. Um, the Pittsburgh Ironmen, which, that's a cool team name, by the way, you know, they drafted him number one, which... Subsequently, he just said, I'm not going to play for y'all. I'm going to go coach high school ball instead, uh, which realistically someone on the Ironman should have just asked him, like, hey, are you are you wanting to actually play before we pick you number one? Um, but I guess no one asked him, so he, he went to coach Pampa High School over playing pro, and then the Pittsburgh Ironman folded b before the season even started anyway. So... Yeah, like I said, it's an interesting time for basketball. Clifton McDealy, which is uh, this guy right here. He is F-tier, obviously. Though I heard he ended up being a pretty good high school coach. So, you know, there's something going for him there. So next is Andy Tonkovich. Um, this guy went number one to the Providence Steamrollers after scoring 1,578 points in a career for Providence. So, you know, that's, that's fine. That's pretty good. Um, and then he went to play 17 games for Providence, averaging 2.6 points, and then taking off midseason to go play for the Wheeling Blues of a different basketball league, uh, and also coach that team. So yeah, major L for Providence there. Um, they also missed out on a couple of pretty good players, so Harry Gallatin and Dolph Shays are Hall of Famers um, that were in that draft, but they ended up with this Andy Tonkovich guy instead who did absolutely nothing for them. So yeah, scouting back then clearly needed a bit of work as well. But yeah, Andy is going to go F tier as well. Sometimes it's kind of hard for me to remember what these players look like. But this is Andy Tonkovich, F tier. So next up is Howie Shannon. So after a solid career at Kansas State, cut short by a new rule that declared him ineligible to due to 
too many games played for some reason. Uh, he went to play for the resident tanking team at the time, the Providence Steamrollers. Uh, then, due to a formality, they were forced to draft him number one kind of the season after to retain his rights, even though he already played for them for a season uh, before he was declared ineligible for college. So, yeah. Um, then, after drafting him, the team folded before the start of the first season. Uh, so, then he went to go play for the Celtics. So, when he played for them, he was actually okay. He averaged 13 a game for, for Providence, then 9 for Boston. He only played two seasons, though. Um I actually think he's going to he's gonna go C-tier for me. You know, the way basketball was back then, guys didn't play as long. He was a productive player during the time he did play. Uh, there were other guys that drafted after him that were better and played longer, so still a disappointment. But he wasn't terrible for the time. So I'm going to say Howie Shannon is C-tier. Next up is Charlie Scher. So the first ever pick with, with the with a league called the NBA. Before this, it was called the BAA. Um, Charlie Scherer was a good scorer for Bowling Green. Uh, he was their all-time leading scorer at the time. He was taken by the Celtics, even though the fans wanted them to take Koozie, which, hilariously, they still got Koozie due to the Chicago Stags folding and, and Charlie Scherer never playing for, for the Celtics. So Koozie was on the Stags, ended up on the Boston Celtics because of the folding thing. Um, and then... Like I said, Cher never played for um, Boston. So then he, he went to a small new league, which then folded as well. So yeah, a lot of folding going on here in the early NBA. Um, but then he got traded to Fort Wayne, the Fort Wayne Pistons, for a Hall of Famer, Bill Sharman. He had a pretty long career with the Pistons, then the St. Louis Hawks after that, and averaged 8-8 eight eight over his career. Um since this list was about how good a player was uh, over their career, not how valuable they were to the team they were necessarily drafted by, I think Cher had an okay enough career to be considered C-tier. The, the Celtics were surely disappointed to have drafted him, but he did still have a pretty long career as a role player. So Charlie Cher is going to be going C-tier as well. So now we have Gene Melchiori. So this is a fun one. Gene Squeaky Melchiori is how he was listed. He was a 5'8 guard, so not incredibly tall, from Bradley, that went number one overall despite being 5'8 and averaging 10 points a game in his last year of college. Um, then he gets in trouble for point shaving for his college team, which apparently happened often back then. Um, the Baltimore Bullets, despite all of this, still took this man number one overall. Um which, obviously, that's questionable at best, decision-making by a franchise. Um, after which, he was drafted, and the NBA permanently banned all players involved in that point-shaving scandal. So Gene never played a minute in the NBA, then went on to work at the post office and as a salesman. So probably the worst pure pick in NBA history. The only argument against it is the fact that Baltimore didn't really miss out on much else, as the draft only included two guys who were ever who ever even made an all-star team, and they weren't particularly great all-stars either. Their, their numbers were never fantastic, even the guys that did make it from this draft. So yeah, uh, that's the only thing that's stopping this from being probably the worst pick in history. But yeah, Gene Melchiori, easily F-tier. Next up is Mark Workman. So Mark Workman is actually pretty good in college. He averaged 23-17 and 17 in the 1952 season. Um... It's not actually a shock that he went number one. However, he decided to play for the Globetrotters for two years over the Milwaukee Hawks, who drafted him. Then he only played two seasons in the league after his Globetrotters stint, averaging five points and three rebounds. He then, like Gene before him, went to become a salesman. So yeah, short career, wasn't even that great of a role player. Um, F tier for me as well. We will get to the good players soon. I swear we will. Just a lot of these early guys were not great players. The, a lot of the decision making when it came to drafting was not well thought out. Um, next up is Ray Felix. So okay, here here we have an actual decent player. So Ray Felix got selected number one overall by the Bullets in 1953 and had he had quite the good rookie year. You know he averaged 18 and 13 as a rookie and one rookie of the year. 
Uh, unfortunately, his career somewhat tailed off after that, uh, but he was still productive for eight years or so. There is some theorizing that he was undermined as a player for being one of the first true African-American stars in the league, and he was traded for some pretty mediocre guys and had his minutes cut for no particular reason the year after his rookie season. So I'm not going to come to a conclusion either way, because like I wasn't there and I didn't experience what actually happened in the in the situation, but um, it certainly is a possibility based on how the league was at the time and just how things look looking back at it. Um, he is a B tier though. He's an actual actually a pretty good player, like I said, even if there were better careers drafted after him in that same draft. Um, also a quick fun fact about him. Bill Russell actually knocked this man out cold on the court once by punching him in the head in a fight because Russell thought he was trying to intimidate him. So yeah, the like I said, the NBA back then was interesting. Um, but yeah, B tier for for Ray Felix. So next up is Frank Selvey. Frank Selvey was an absolute beast of a college player. He averaged 41.7 a game in his senior year, and he was the only D1 player to ever score 100 in a game, which crazy. But he never quite lived up to that in the NBA. Um, he was drafted by the Baltimore Bullets, who apparently had the number one pick every season back then. Um, he had a really good rookie year. He averaged 19, but then he went to the U.S. Army after that year, and his career basically stalled after his time in the service. Um, a few years later, though, he eventually revived it a bit, kind of putting in some good years with the early to mid-60s Lakers. Uh, overall, not a bad player, but didn't live up to his billing. So, so B tier for me for Frank Selvey. So next up, one of the best names on the list, Dick Ricketts. So he was a pretty solid player for his very short basketball career. Uh, he, he was drafted by the Hawks, but was also signed to pitch professional baseball for the Rochester Red Wings. So he got his rights sold to the Rochester Royals. Um, he was a pretty decent role player for the for the Royals for a couple years, but then decided to move on from his basketball career after being traumatized with what happened to his good friend and teammate, Maurice Stokes. So, if you guys haven't heard the story of, of Stokes, I'm going to cover that a little bit, because it, it's a pretty important thing to happen in NBA history. Um, uh, Stokes hit his head on the floor in a game of an NBA regular season game, uh, and then over the coming days, uh, Stokes, he, he, he finished playing in that game, uh, and then he was injured and knocked unconscious due to hitting his head. Then played in a game three days later after finishing that game where he hit his head. Um, he became ill after the after the second game, and Ricketts and Twyman were assisting him to help him get on the team plane, to to which he, he told Ricketts, he said, I feel like I'm going to die, um, to which then he had a seizure on the flight and ended up paralyzed for the rest of his life, dying very young. A, a real tragedy in NBA history. So I don't particularly blame Ricketts for wanting to step away from basketball after that. I mean, it's a good friend of his that suffered a very traumatic injury. Um, and he was already good enough at baseball that he could move into that. Um, but yeah, so finishing up on Ricketts, he was, like I said, a pretty decent NBA player for a couple years, but he didn't stay long enough to go any higher than the C tier. Uh, so yeah, C tier for Dick Ricketts. But like I said, if it was on best names, he's going in S tier. Um, next up is C. Hugo Green. I think I'm saying that right, or Cy Hugo Green. Um, another great name though. I mean, he had a pretty long and consistently productive NBA career. Um, not great though. He was, he was pretty unspectacular as far as players went. Uh, he does have the unfortunate distinction of being the only guy drafted above Bill Russell in his draft. Uh, unfortunately for him, his career averages of 9 and 4 are not nearly enough to live up to that building, billing. So yeah, uh, C tier for C. Hugo Green, uh, but he wasn't a terrible player. Um, next up is Hot Rod Hundley. So... What I really want to know is why players don't have cool nicknames anymore. <laughs> Everyone back in the day was nicknamed something interesting, or their name was just interesting. I think we need more of that. Everyone's name is kind of boring today. But yeah, um, Hot Rod Hundley, was, he was pretty good in the college ranks. He averaged 27-13 and 13 for West Virginia in his junior year. Uh, he was a bit injury-plagued in his pro career, from what I could tell, but he still never really lived up to the hype even when he was healthy. 
He did make two all-star teams, however, so his career wasn't a total wash. It was just short, and like I said, injury plagued. He had consistent knee issues. Ended his NBA career with averages of 8, 3, and 3. So, in my opinion, he fits in the C tier. So, look what we have here. A good player, Elgin Baylor. So, finally we get to a player that was actually good. So, Elgin Baylor, as you all probably know, if you're watching my channel, he lives up to the hype of being a number one overall pick. A very talented player from the beginning. Baylor averaged 31.3 and 19.5 rebounds in college, despite not being recruited at all due to college teams not recruiting at black schools during the time. Um, yeah, he ended up going to, I think, the University of Idaho because um, someone there said that they could get him a football scholarship. And so he went for football, and then instead of playing any football at all, he just went for, tried out for the basketball team, and he was so good that he made the team. Um, yeah, so then he was drafted by the the Lakers after that in a move for the Lakers to try to save their franchise as they were struggling, and he absolutely saved their franchise. Him and Jerry West were key to the revival of the Lakers, and that franchise would not be where it is today without them. Baylor's career averages are incredible. 27.4 points a game and 13.5 rebounds a game. Easily S tier. That's not Elgin Baylor. This is Elgin Baylor. It's funny that I didn't mess up on any of the guys that were completely unknowns, but I, I pick up the absolute wrong guy for Elgin Baylor. <laughs> but yeah, so then next up is Bob Boozer, who another player on the all-time great names list. Bob Boozer wasn't quite as good as the number one pick the years before or after the year he was taken, but he was still actually a pretty good player when, you know, all things considered. He had a career spanning a decade and multiple seasons averaging over 20 points and close to 10 rebounds a game. Uh, while he was never a dominant big in the grand scheme of things, he was really good. Um, usually I'd say he he's kind of B-tier-ish, but I actually think he fits fine in A. He was he was realistically the best selection that, this, that Cincinnati could have taken at that spot, and you can't really be disappointed in the numbers he provided uh, for the time. The only better player than him in his draft outright was Wilt Chamberlain, and he was unavailable due to the fact that he was a territorial pick. So he went to the local teams. They did, they did that back in the day. So, um, but yeah, so Bob Boozer, he was a, he was a good player. I'm going to put Bob Boozer A tier. And the final player on this tier list, and would you look at that, two all-time greats in three years, Oscar Robertson. So, the draft is starting to turn around a little bit, as you can see. Um, I really go into depth on how Oscar played in my MVP video series, so if you're interested in that, go check it out. But, but yeah, Oscar lived up to the hype. Uh, a kid from Indianapolis who learned how to shoot on a peach basket. He had a dominant high school career, a dominant college career. I mean, he averaged 34 at Cincinnati, uh, and he won two straight state championships in high school before going to the league. So he was a success everywhere he went. He became the first guy to average a triple-double in his in his career for a season. Um, and then he ended his career with a crazy career average line of 25.7, uh, 7.5 rebounds and 9.5 assists. I think that's all that needs to be said. Oscar Robinson went far and far beyond any hype that there was for him. Uh, easily another S tier here. So yeah, that will include this list here, spanning from 1947 to 1960. I'm gonna finish up. I'm gonna do all the rookies. I think even even some of the most recent ones. I think there's at least a little bit that can be taken away from them. Obviously, they're inconclusive in a lot of cases, but I think you can kind of kind of discover a little bit to how, how some of the, even the more recent rookies are playing and how that's lining up to where they were picked. Um, but yeah, so let me know if you guys like this video series. It's a little different, especially a lot of these guys that no one's really ever heard of. But like I said at the beginning of the video, I think it's kind of interesting to kind of uh, dive deep into NBA history and just kind of do a little bit of discovering on players that really no one ever talks about. So yeah, that's going to conclude this video. If you liked it, go ahead and give it a like and subscribe. I've got plenty of tier lists coming in the future. But yeah, uh, with that being said, I hope you guys enjoyed.